Yes. So while we, before we dive in into that, um, let's take an opening prayer. So I would like a volunteer to help us. This is the agenda we're going to be um, following for today's uh, monthly technical meeting. So the first thing there is an opening prayer. So I would like a volunteer to just simply unmute and give us the honors of the opening prayer. Any volunteer in the house, please. We have so many persons joining this call, so we shouldn't have issue having somebody to volunteer for a prayer. Or maybe I will call somebody. Let's pray. Thank you very much. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless your name. Thank you for a time like this. We thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for all you've been doing and what you're about to do. So glory, honor be unto thee in the name of Jesus. Amen. We invite you to this meeting. Come and take preeminence. Give us the wisdom, the knowledge that is needed to partake in this meeting. So that by the day, you shall have a cause to say hallelujah to your name. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So because SP is a professional organization and in the professional space, we also have our Muslim brothers. So we're going to give them that respect and do them the honors um, in the next 30 seconds or so they can go ahead and um, do their prayers. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. So um, on my agenda, after the opening prayer, what we have next is a safety moment, all right, the safety brief. Yes, this is not a physical gathering, but there are still some safety precautions and safety moments we need to observe around us wherever we are, okay? Um, so first of all, um, if you're not speaking, please make sure your mic is muted so the sound from your background or your discussion would not um, interrupt the meeting. So then if you want to speak, please just simply signify by using the raise hand reaction button and you'll be called upon to speak. And then also be a lot of your environment wherever you are, because I'm sure some of us would mind be joining this on transit or in a, in a certain area. So please be aware of your environment. And also please, let's keep the chat box active. Um, let's respond to the speaker's question if he has some, or um, make contributions to what he is um, delivering. And then if we have questions, um, let's use the chat box to drop it there. So we can use the letter C or the prefix C for comments and use the prefix Q for questions um, and then your questions will be treated and answered, okay? And then also if you're using a headset or some kind of mics, please endeavor and ensure that you can still um, hear other sounds around your environment in case of the sound of an alarm or any situations around you, all right? And then um, be safe wherever you are. Um, that means try to make sure you maintain social distance or you have your face mask on or you wash your hands now and then if you find the run running water around you. So just always keep safe from wherever you are. And then for those of us joining, of course, we're all joining with our devices, but some of us or most of us might be joining with our laptops. Just endeavor to make sure there are no liquid contents or liquid things around your device to avoid any hazards. So thank you very much. We're just gonna move on to the next agenda, which is the recognition of senior members. Um, 
in SPE, we have those we look up to or we follow behind, either because they've gone this road before us or um, they're there encouraging us as we're going down this road. So we have some of our senior members on the call today. Thank you so much, our senior members, for joining, for doing us the honors. We sincerely do appreciate. So first off, I'm going to start with my section chairman. Um, Dr. Joseph Amebi Bama is on the call with us today. Uh, we're going to hear his voice very soon. So, and then we also have the likes of one of our SD, a section director, a one-time section chairman, um, Alaji Mohammed Otman on the call. Thank you so much, sir, for joining. We sincerely do appreciate. Um, I think those are basically the senior members I see. Oh, I see Bright too. No, I think that's right on K, not over the K. Um, so thank you guys. And as I keep seeing more of our senior members join, I'll definitely um, recognize them. So, but at this time, we'll just move on to the next agenda for today, which is the opening remark. Remember, I promise you we're going to hear his amazing voice very soon and him to share with us the opening remarks. So at this time, um, I'll welcome our section chairman, Dr. Joseph and maybe Bamatu, please go ahead and give us the opening remark. So the virtual podium is yours, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this um, monthly YP technical meeting, monthly technical meeting. Um, I most uh, especially, um, uh, especially welcome uh, the speaker. Um, is my very senior colleague from the, by far that was when he graduated if I've even joined the university. He has been here before uh, and he has uh, not just here, he sponsored one of the MTNs and also gave a presentation. So thank you very much once again for coming to honor us and uh, teach us and impact knowledge as well. Um, today's topic uh, is, um, is quite fascinating, uh, directional drilling is fundamentals for well planning and effective operations. For, for those of us in, in petroleum engineering, we understand um, how directional drilling came about. And um, it's very important, particularly when you have um, some specific well problems and uh, also when uh, you have reserves in, uh, in build up areas or inaccessible areas. And that is one option you can use um, to really tap or extract yeah, hydrocarbon. So um, it's, it's very, very important, though an expensive project, but uh, we all know that uh, the return on investment usually is very high because a uh, uh, major part of the pay zone is usually assessed through uh, directional drilling. Uh, so um, I welcome you and I welcome everyone. Uh, I know that you are going to give us a very useful talk. You are going to really teach us this evening and we are going to learn uh, very well from you. Um, I pray that this uh, presentation will go smoothly and uh, everyone that has joined this meeting is going to benefit immensely and uh, at the end will not uh, regret joining. Thank you very much for supporting us and uh, I will employ everyone that has joined this meeting to please listen keenly and uh, take notes because it's going to help you some other day. Take And also take advantage of this. This man is not just um, a teacher or a professional. He also owns a company. Uh, GeoPro, so um, he has been doing well, he has been exhibiting, he has been developing tools, fantastic tools um, uh, that have been so useful to the industry. So please take advantage of this lecture and gain knowledge. Thank you very much and God bless all of you. Thank you very much, sir. That was a wonderful opening remark. And like he said, if you didn't pick anything, make sure you pick the words, uh, his last words of taking advantage of this lecture and everything you're going to learn here. All right, so we'll move on to the next agenda for today, which is the introduction of our speaker. All right, so our speaker is an experienced director with a demonstrated history of working in the oil and energy industry. He is skilled in petroleum engineering, well engineering, and emphasizes on drilling optimization. So we chose the perfect person for the perfect um, theme. He's, um, he's also skilled in mentoring, in team building, and 
he has good understanding of the software industry. He's a strong professional with a postgraduate degree in petroleum engineering, as well as masters, a master of business administration that is focused in business development, strategy, management, marketing, and related support services from the University of Surrey. So let's welcome our speaker today, none other than Mr. Chimere Nkwacha, Chief Executive Officer of GeoPro Oil Field Technologies. You're welcome, sir. And the virtual podium is yours, please. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. I feel like I'm running for office. You can run. I'll definitely vote. <laughs> okay, let me, let's do this. You can all see my screen? Yes, sir, I can. I think I need to switch screens. Um, hold on. Which screen is it? Which one are you seeing now? Let's see. Um, the double display one. Okay, this is the stream screen for me, but let's see. We'll find a way to make it work. One second. Anyway, Dr. Joseph, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. Much appreciated. Um, what can I say? Um, it's, it's always a notable, um, it's always good to be, to be able to, um, to, to come back and, you know, share some of your experience with everybody else. Yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of difference. Now the thing we're not sure. Now what? So which screen <laughs> are you guys seeing now? I've seen a very beautiful flower, blue flower. Okay, that, your... is, not, that is not the plan. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm, I'm, I think I'm tech savvy enough to figure it out. Duplicate these displays. Okay, keep changes. Yes, that's the trick. Okay, now we can go. Voila, we're in business. All right, so if you have a question, I would suggest and recommend that you just you write it down, possibly in the chat, or keep it to the end, because I'm going to try and pack one month of training for experienced DDs into, into 40 minutes or less. And in so doing, I will also try to explain what each of the screens mean and what they stand for and how you can bet we can benefit from them. In, uh, from the, you know, in the industry. I believe that, first of all, before I even start, I believe that directional drilling is a part and parcel of the industry and will be till the day the industry stops to exist because it is one way in which you can actually reduce your carbon footprint, okay? The reason being that you don't need to, you don't need to have too many wells to tap or produce the reservoir. You can use that with a few, with much fewer wells um, in the um, you know in in a, in a field. So my agenda today is to go through the history of extraction drilling, the types of wells that we you know attribute or put into that category, some of the drilling technologies, and hopefully talk to you about how we how we look at drill string behavior or BHAs, and key element in in doing so we will touch on key elements that come into play during planning and also come into play during the operation itself, or basically the kind of challenges that we face as directional drilling consultants or experts or companies or service providers like Schlumberger, Halliburton, B Baker, um, Weatherford, and a bunch of other ones in Nigeria like PDL, um, Seagolf, Drillpet, WOG, all, all, all of them face the same challenges yeah, when it comes to operational deliverability. Okay, so what is directional drilling? To put it plainly, it is simply the science of creating, creating or controlling or correcting a borehole um, to intersect what we call a predefined or determined bottom hole location. You can't just wake up and drill blindly because you will end up somewhere else. And you will find out as the, in the course of this presentation that in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, they were drilling vertical wells that were in fact deviated wells. And most of these wells were at 50 degrees or more inclination and they didn't even know it. <clears throat> and so 
in some of those wells, they actually missed some of the horizons they were headed for, even though they produced oil. And it was much later when in the advent of surveying that they went back um, to the old borehole or they intersected some of these wells by banging into them that they understood where the location was and what was happening down hole. So if you look at the figure here, we have A, B, C, D. A, B is a vertical well. The industry started by drilling vertical wells, okay? But the need for, you know, intersecting or reserves at different points arose. And one of the key reasons for the development of directional drilling was to intersect um, or to intersect a blowout well so that you can kill it from another well, which will be, uh, which is something like uh, what happened in Makando. You remember Makando for 2010, BP's um, Gulf Coast fiasco. And normally you, what you do is that you drill a relief well to hit the horizon that is that is where the hydrocarbon is coming in and you flood it with heavy mud. All right, so that's one of the reasons for directional wells. The other one is to tap on bypass reserves like with Hojota wells and Sidetrax. And the other one is to, is to, but is to target you know, a reservoir that that is in normally in a location that is ecologically sensitive. For example, if you had a, a deposit, say two kilometers in into the into the Atlantic Ocean from say somewhere in Ondo State or or Delta, um, you will you might you might very much more you might you are more likely to intercept that that target using a horizontal well from, from, from here, if that is the extent to which the field development plan calls, calls for, than to go into the ocean and set up a platform, all right? Because then you are distorting eco the ecology of the ocean, and sometimes it could be a place that's protected. What else is it? It is also what we use as a primary conduit for well placement. What is well placement? In this reservoir, in this diagram, each of these targets are normally in a plane that is horizontal plane and well defined. It's uh, you have a target top and bottom, and then you have a horizontal plane. However, in a well like this, where you have a, a, a where you have um, uh, where you're trying to follow what we call a sweet spot, which is where you believe you're going to have the best uh, best uh, potential to produce a reservoir and make the well or the or the or the well. Um, commercial, you follow a thought variable, which is a which a variable or or or, or, or uh, yeah variable, which is which is in the vertical sec vertical vertical depth or thickness, where you follow that and it adds a thought component to your to your well 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 um, target. So you land it on a plane, but you follow a different three D model, which is what we call a geostering model which is depicted by the drill string going up and down these anclines and synclines of a reservoir to follow the sweet spot. That is what we call geostering or well placement, depending on who is, is, is speaking, okay? So history of directional drilling. Americans would like to say they did it, but we, never, we don't know, to be honest. We know that in the mid 1900s, Russia was very well advanced. But what we do know is documented, um, it seemed like they did a bunch of stuff in the US. The first, uh, the first horizontal well was actually, or directional well was actually drilled in California. And then you came up with the Soviets bringing out a turbo drill, which is more like a turbine system. And then the first horizontal well that was recorded was drilled in 1944 in Pennsylvania at 500 feet of TVD. Then came the PDM or inverse monos pump system, what we call positive play motors today. And we normally call them motors, but basically both the PDM and the turbine are called mod motors. Came, in, came into effect in 1970s and were produced by Dyna Drill, Navi Drill, Baker Drill, Christensen, a bunch of other people. And today you probably have about a thousand companies in the world making downward motors, but they only became stable sometime in the late 80s and early 90s. In the 1990s, we now had, a, I mean, the whole industry went, you know, I mean, went all out because I guess it was then it dawned on us that cheap oil was no longer cheap, 
because you have to start looking at ways to stay in one place and drill several wells. So it, it brought about the whole concept of pad and uh, platform, um, um, you know, platform uh, technology and engineering. And he saw the advent of LWD and RSS, where the LWD logging wire drilling tools started replacing your traditional wireline tools. And you saw root stable systems replacing mod motors, and because they were supposedly more efficient, I'll touch on that in a little while. And then we started seeing, you know, well placement or geostead wells using gamma ray resistivity, which were more focused rather than compensated. So they had natural log or focused, you know, as a motor resistivities and gamma rays, and could then use that to determine bend bed boundaries and on and, and dip and orientation so that they can follow that dip, you know, and ride it where they had the lowest gamma ray but the highest resistivities. And you, you, you saw such tools with the ANA drill, which is Schlumberger's GST, which stands for Joe Steering Tool, and what they called the RAP, which we stood for, it, they, they have a new name for it now, but then it was called resistivity at the bit, which had a bit resistivity and some buttons on top and that you could use to, or on the tool that you can use to orient, to, to know what was above and below the tool. And all of these had, a way of telling you which, which side was up, which side was down. So that's the history of, of directional drilling in a nutshell. Now we go into the nitty gritty. So basically um, the diagram on the left is a typical build and hold, that's what we call it, build and hold uh, directional well. It could very easily go from surface location to the kickoff point, to the end of build, and then another kickoff point to the end and that end of build and it goes horizontal or on that kickoff point and it starts going vertical or near vertical, which is called an A-shaped well. So that's what it is. But on the right, you see something completely different. In the 1900s, we drill, we drill the wells blindly. And then as you go along, we introduce acid bottle surveying, which was being used in South Africa for gold, for mines, for drilling mine shafts, you know? And then, and then from there to gyroscopic technology, which is now in the not seeking and read gyro uh, position. And now we can put them even in your, in your drill string for real time, um, um, you know, um, surveys when you are drilling in near, in near well clusters where you could have interference because most, in short, every directional drilling downhole packet that you have on pipe is based on a magnetic survey system, which means that if it's around a lot of steel components that are not demagnetized or non, not, not, not magnetic material, it will get distorted. At least your azimuth will, your inclination will be okay. So basically this is how we've transcended over time. And today we now drill 42,000 feet long wells as ERD wells. And we are doing this in cycling. In, in, new, in, 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 um, in Newfoundland and a bunch of other places regularly. But between that, you can see where bent housing motors, which is your stable motors came into be. And you can see where MWD came in and where you start seeing gyro steering and gyro MWD and rotary stable systems kicking in in the late nineties, which is actually the auto track. Uh, which was followed closely by Schlumberger's power drive in 2000. And thereafter, you had everybody coming in, Geopilot, RST, or everybody started going to at uh, load system because that was the future. We don't know what's going to be next, but we are there right now. Okay. Typical well plots. So this is what your well plot looks like. So like I said before, this is, a, this is actually a, an airship well. You have the first kickoff. It builds about... 15 degrees, he holds it for a while, then it drops back to vertical. That's a shape well. This is a result when well. it's not very clear, it's copy and paste from the internet, so don't be upset, but it shows you what it is. You basically kick off, you hold for a little bit, you kick off again, and you land the well, and you drill the lateral accordingly. And this is the plan of the well. So you kick off from here, you drill from here, and you move that well in that direction. In this other one here, this is the direction you're going to. So that's the bottom hole location determined by the circle or the bottom hole target there by that circle that's there at the bottom TD of 3531. All right. 
Now, how do we deflect the well? There are very various, various ways for creating deflection. I will start with the most basic of them all. In 1990, I actually was a part of the team that did this in Agbada 57 and 58. Um, and the, the direction pillars that did this on, that, on those wells are still my friends today. So basically, when you jet, what you do is you, 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 norm, you will always normally use a, 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 um, a tricon bit. All right. The reason is it's got three defined nozzles. So you make one nozzle larger than the rest. The whole idea is to pass hydraulic power through that nozzle, and that nozzle will gorge its way through and create a path. All right. And normally this is done using a simple, a simple um, non-stable asset. Well, it's a rotary stick assembly, but non-stable. And you want to do this to jet away from nearby clusters. When we nudge a well, this is one of the things that we do when we nudge, all right, without a mod motor in hole. You basically just create that little bit there and you push. Sometimes, and then you can also nudge a well by using a mod motor by, by just simply positioning the high side in the direction you want to go and you just keep it there and gently initiate the nudge or the sidetrack basically or push away from the primary borehole. This is normally used to push away from the, from the primary direction of the borehole, not to sidetrack per se. All right, so you start from here, it does that, you push it down a bit more, you continue doing it, and before you know it, you have a predefined direction and you can go ahead. That's jetting. Or you can use a whipstock. Normally you use a whipstock to sidetrack. It could be open hole or cased hole. Um, and, and you can, you can, I mean, I'm going to show you a video of an open hole we've stopped from, from Old Smith now, Shlomo uh, Basically, what you do is that you're running hole with a whistling assembly. Nowadays, we all have one, one chip system. So the one chip system means that you run the whip stop, you are able to set the whip stop, all right? And at the same time, at the same time, you are able to run, to disengage the, you know, the, the meals and come off the whip stop face and mill a window, which is what you see here. So this orange box or whatever we call it, rectangle is your borehole. And essentially you come off this, the face of the whipstock and you're able to mill off the side of the whipstock and create a new borehole. That's what it is. Now, to show you the video, this is a very short video from Trackmaster. Uh, and Trackmaster, I don't know who owns it now, but I, it used to be Shlombi J. Smith. With stock and cementing system eliminates the uncertainty of kicking off with a cement plug by setting the whip stock and cementing in a single trip, which saves up to 24 hours when compared with traditional open hole side tracking with a cement plug. Sorry, so is it possible to increase the volume a bit or that's the volume in a single trip? Yes, please. The assembly line provides precise kickoff orientation with a drill bit friendly ramp. Yes, much better. The Trackmaster OHC system offers a level of side tracking assurance that's not possible with traditional cement plug side tracking methods. A ball activated triaxial expandable anchor locks the whipstock at the desired depth and orientation. The system's all metallic anchor makes running and hold faster, and the larger inside diameter accommodates pumping cement at higher flow rates. A retention collet supports extended lengths of tailpipe below the anchor for selective cement plug placement, and it minimizes contamination to the cement when removing the drill string. A second ball is dropped to unseat the stinger. Then cement is pumped, isolating the original borehole below the kickoff point. Once isolation is complete, pulling out of the hole begins. After reaching the surface, the directional drilling BHA is immediately run in. The Trackmaster OHC system circumvents the obstacles encountered with conventional cement plug side tracking. 
Matching the Trackmaster OHC system with specific wellbore departure objectives provides drilling efficiencies. So that's that for lift stocks. So what that does is essentially it allows you to go in hole with the BHA and not bother milling, milling the hole. And you just set that with cement and you go ahead. Now forget about all the, all the marketing thing around it. Uh, everyone that's running whip stock knows that you can do it in a few hours or you can do it in several days. It all depends on how much integrity you get around the seat when you land it and the ankle if it does go, if it does sit properly. Second way is simple, a mod motor with a bend, with a bend housing. So this is typically in what a mod motor PDM looks like, an inverse manure system. Basically, you've got a top saw, and some places you have what they call a dumb valve, but a top saw really allows you to connect the, you know, the, the rest of the beer, a drill string to it. You have the, the power section, which little rotors and a stator, which is shown here. You have the rotor, that little metallic bit in there, and the stator, which could be either all metal, could be half metal or all rubber. And then you have the S, Soviet adjustable bend housing. Some people call it ABH, um, but basically it is just a bend. I will show you how that works. And normally you have a, a, a stabilizer here. And normally when you also run a mod motor, you, run, you tend to run stabilizer above. In some cases you don't, uh, but the whole idea is that this, the bit, the stabilizer here and the other stabilizer here form a fulcrum that defines the your ability to get a certain a certain um, dog leg or build rate, okay? So this is, looking at this, this little bit here, you have what we, this is what we call a five, six mode, uh, um, lobe configuration because you have one, two, three, four, five lobes on the rotor and six lobes on the stator that allows this to roll around. And by so doing, when fluid is pumped through, by so doing, it spins the bit, all right? Now, this is, the same thing I just showed you, but what, I put this in for a reason. If you look at the, the, the bottom line, bottom image, you have one, one, two to nine, 10, all right? Basically going from left to right, you have lower speed and higher torque. Going from right to left, you have lower torque and higher speed. So one, two low configuration are high speed motors, Why nine, 10 low configuration, motors are high top motors. Now going back to the deflection. So this is what the surface adjustable bend housing typically looks like. All right, normally you can be sent this to the rig, it will be straight and slightly loose. Um, and the DD on the rig side, DD means direction driller will now set this, the numbers here to match the numbers here, which will determine the ability of the motor to build. All right. So if you want a one and 1.15 inch bent house setting, you are going to match this number here with the 1.15 that is here. So this will this you align this point, this mark here to that mark there, and you make up the lower housing, which will now give you what we call a 1.15 degree offset, and that can determine what kind of build rate you're gonna get. All right, or deflection rate. So that's how you deflect with a mod motor. Um, and yeah. And then we have rotary stable systems. All right. So the RSS system is arguably the uh, our nearest um, resemblance to rotary drilling. Rotary drilling is very efficient. If you don't have to, if you don't have to hit any target. And all you have to do is rotate your drill string, rotary drilling is efficient, all right? So everything that we've done since the 1900s till date is to approach the efficiencies that we have with rotary BHAs, which is simply collars, stabilizers, and bit, and then drill pan, of course. So the push to bit system shown here, Basically, what it does is it has a, a component on the screen on itself that it pushes out to create deflection. For example, if this was going to go high side, which is up, 
it will deflect consistently downwards, pushing itself upwards by deflecting the pads, you know, here on this tool downwards. This tool that you see here is Schlumberger, the peak Schlumberger's power drive system. All right. And this is what actually a push to base system looks like. All right. Among the push to base systems are power drive system from Schlumberger and also, um, also, um, um, there's a new company out of the US now that sells that rents them out. And it's the same. Somehow you can add, you can say that auto track is a push to bit system. But I would point this, I would say it's a bit of a hybrid. And then you have um, some new systems from Weatherford that are now actually push to bit systems. Uh, what people have found out is that push to bit systems are actually, actually a lot cheaper to ma ma maintain and, and, and service than point to base systems. And I will tell you a little bit why between this one, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the power drive and the next one, which is called the power drive XC. Basically in the power drive, there's a, there's a valve system that allows you to push each of the three parts on the tool um, out, you know, or push the parts in one direction consistently to create a, a deviation in a certain direction, right? Whereas, in this particular one, this is the power drive exceed, which is a point the base system. What you do is that you deflect an internal shaft to create, to create, to point the bit in the direction you want to go. All of these directions are actually monitored closely by a computerized gyro system, if you want to call it that. Basically, it knows where high side is and it knows exactly what we direction to to point um this one in this one for example into for example in this one the way this tool is able to hold this direction or this deflection is simple what it does is it puts it in that direction holds it by turning a motor counterclockwise to your up to the to the rotary speed of the drill string now you can imagine if you are wrong if you're still at 140 rpm this tool is able to counterclockwise rotate the internal shaft at 140 RPMs in the opposite direction to keep this tool face in the direction you want it to be after it's been set. And this is what it looks like. It looks like anything that you would have had, a bit, a stabilizer, and, um, and then at the end of the another stabilizer. Uh, but that's what it is. So I'll show you a place on two videos of the RS. I will try and short, I'll try and see if I can make this shorter so we can we can get to the questions. But this should give you a good idea of what a push to base system looks like. Power drive directional programming can be modified from the surface to suit the customer's needs. A unique sequence of flow changes programs the power drive tool to steer in the required direction. The electronics package stabilizes at the demanded tool phase. Sorry, so it looks like we might need volume again. This tool phase is then transferred down to the control valve, where 5% of the total mud flow is redirected through the rotating disc. Is that better? Yes, very much so. Thank you. This conveys the mud flow down to the outside pads. If you look at this point, you can see that it, 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 the outside, that part there is, is extending more. That means it's pushing it out to the lower right-hand corner to go left. The power drive bias unit utilizes fully rotating external pads to deliver side force to the bit. This means no dependence on friction with a borehole wall, no limit on back weaving, and far less risk of stuck pipe. Here we see the power drive tool drilling an extreme well path for Norsk Hydro. The maximum TDD difference from peak to trough is a. All right, before I go further, this little darker shades here are actually the sweet spots. All they're trying to do is to connect as much as possible those sweet spots because they're like lenses as they go ahead, as they drill ahead. 180 meters or 590 feet. 
the final whole angle is 126 degrees. Hard right, a safer option providing lower risk, lower total cost, and higher value. All right. What they won't tell you is that the power drive system was actually designed to be a bit uh, before, before Schlumberger bought, uh, bought um, Camco. It was designed by Reed Hyclog engineers to be a bit and um, that you could rerun. And it turned out to be an exceptional tool for Schlumberger and put them in the, in the, in the running for arguably the, 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 the biggest provider of drilling, uh, the actual drilling services worldwide. But here again is the exit. Hopefully it's a shorter video and it's the power informative. The exceed system provides accurate steering and reliability in harsh, rugged environments and challenging drilling conditions. It extends the benefits of rotary steerable drilling to difficult wells that exceed the performance limits of externally steered tools. Power drive exceed points the bit using a rugged internal steering mechanism that is completely enclosed to significantly reduce wear and improve reliability. This mechanism has a bit shaft that pivots within the collar through a universal joint coupling, tilting the bit in the desired direction. A motor counter rotates at the same speed as drill string RPM to hold the bit shaft tool face orientation geostationary. Internal components and seals are protected from wellbore temperatures up to 302 degrees Fahrenheit in all fluid types and in high shock environments. The internal mechanism improves steering in soft and interbedded formations as there is no dependency on wellbore contact. That makes power drive exceed ideal for open hole side tracking and over gauge or washed out holes and improves steering and in hard interbedded formations to keep the well bore in the target window. Power drive exceed does not restrict bit nozzling or hydraulics and bit nozzles can be optimized without using a flow restrictor, allowing steering response in soft formations to be maximized. Increasing total flow area improve steering response by reducing washout at the bit. Power drive exceed point the bit steering can be used with bi-center bits to increase hole gauge. This is particularly advantageous when drilling extended reach and deep water wells. Combining power drive exceed with telescope MWD telemetry provides real-time inclination and azimuth at the bit to guide steering decisions. A closed loop inclination hold mode follows the desired trajectory, automatically correcting any deviations in inclination and azimuth, and allowing the driller to focus on drilling optimization and maximizing ROP. Like the rest of the power drive family, power drive exceed external components all rotate continuously while drilling, which improves hole cleaning, increases ROP, and reduces differential sticking. The full rotation also delivers a smooth, high quality borehole that makes running casing and cementing easier. Power Drive Exceed gives a superior degree of steering accuracy and reliability in harsh environments and soft formations. This service continues to successfully operate when externally steered mechanisms have reached their performance limits. Okay, so let me say this. Before I go to the next next thing, let me give you a recap. All right. So motors are great, cheap solutions. All right. But you need to drill when you drill with motors, you've got to, to drill directional, you've got to slide, which is means that you're not you're not taking the drill string, you're only pumping through the, the string so that you can orient or steer um, the, 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 the borehole and the drill string. And, and then you rotate you know, basically most of the time because you have to have a slide or rotate combination and also clean the hole uh, back ring, for example. 
Um, so basically, you end up what, what we call a corkscrew. So you see a, a, a quick, a little bit of a dink, which is when you when you build, and then you see a smoothing out when you rotate, when you slice, sorry, and when you then rotate. The beauty of RSS tools is that because they are always seemingly rotating, um, yes, even the ones that have anchor systems for their, for their pads to point them in a direction, um, because they're all seemingly rotating, you have a much smoother borehole. And for those of you that are pedophysicists uh, and in reservoir engineering, you will appreciate that because it means that you are able to tell a bit, to be a bit more, I mean, your 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 log, your log inform, your downhole data or log information is a bit more precise. And you don't have to make so many corrections, or you don't have to just assume that it's a certain, certain um um, size gauge so that you can interpret the logs and then you end up being off by a certain percentage which could be the difference between success and failure uh, so so that's the beauty of rss secondly almost every rotary stable system in the world today is instrumented at the nose with directional date directional information and and gamma ray and can communicate with with the drill string telemetry which is the MWD and other logging wire drilling tools behind it for, for, your, for the engineers and those that are actually monitoring the wells to be able to make informed judgment as you drill. All right, so the applications are one of the challenges as well. And one of the considerations when you are looking at the directional drilling work is surveying and anti-collision. Take a look at this cluster. These are all wells. All those colors are wells that have been drilled and some to be drilled. And then this is the reality as well. So you've got these two platforms, but all the wells are crisscrossing into each other. All right. It is your job as a planning engineer or a drilling engineer or even a directional driller to stay away or find your way between all these clusters like this one here, root your well through this, this blue well here, through these other clusters where this, this tube you're seeing here, it represents, or this uneven tube represents the uncertainties of the, of, the, of the survey measurement for each of these wells. So this is what you're trying to do. You have two uncertainties and you're trying to thread your way. This is, let's assume this, uh, this is your plan here. You're trying to thread your way between them or around them or above them. And you need to keep a certain distance so that you do not run the risk of banging into a producing well. Even if it's not producing, if you bang into it and eat up the casing, um, that could become a problem for that well when it starts producing much later. All right. So this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to thread your way through a cluster like this. So the purple line will be another well and the blue line here that is that the blue single line will be the well you're trying to thread through this this cluster of wells and we do that traditionally with a bunch of tools one of which is what we call anti-collision monitoring which includes the spider plot which is i mean at least the, what you have on the right is actually an active spider plot Schlumberger, kind of commercialize this in the late 90s, early, early 2000s, where you could actually put in real time surveys and it can show your departure from the wells that are within your frame as you drill them. And you can tell you which, you can see which way, which way direction to stay away from uh, and get away from them. All right, so those are one of the things that you do. And this is the same idea that you adopt in a relief well application. So if you have a well that is that has, there's a blowout and you, you can't seem to kill it and it's still blowing, you can drill from a nearby or some other pad or location, intercept that well where you want to you want to where you want to hone into where you want to be, where you want to hit it at, and you just simply flood it with heavy, heavy mud to kill the, you know, to, to just kill that blowout and know it's done. Other considerations is, I mean, take a look at the, the, the three BHAs. Um, a, 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 that you have in the string one, two, and three. So we look at BHA design when we start. When we can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can go ahead. Okay, because I'm seeing a sign here that says see something. 
Okay. All right. So, so you 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 tend to look at. I mean, when we started directionally, like I said at the beginning, when they were drilling wells everywhere in the world, all seemingly vertical. What happens that everybody threw in a BHA, any kind of BHA, it could be a BHA like the fulcrum assembly, which could end up anywhere. That's what I'm trying to show you. It could end up anywhere. You cannot determine where it's going to go. All right. It could bend at any point and decide where it's going to go. And then BHA number two is a what we call a pendulum assembly. Basically, it, what, why it's called a pendulum is that it will always tend to go with gravity in the direction that you want it to go. All right, that, it, that, that means you can always try to drill vertically. So if you have, an, if you want an S-shaped well that has a natural tendency to drop at say 0 0.5 degrees per 100 feet of drop rate, you could use, instead of using a, a, a stable motor system or even an RSS system, you can simply put the pendulum assembly there if direction is not of any concern and it, it will naturally drop on its own. And one thing, that we found out also is the higher you spin the pipe, the less likely it is to build. It would naturally tend towards vertical. And the reason is that you're offsetting the frictional drag and of the side forces that may, accom that may, that may accompany lower or slower RPMs. On the right is the packed assembly. Normally a packed assembly is designed to hold an inclination and an azimuth in theory, right? Inclination, yes, until it hits a hard spot and it could just deflect and continue to hold the new inclination and azimuth. So anywhere you want to run a packed assembly, it has to be a place where you have a tendency that it will always hold or, or stay where it is because you don't have laminations, you don't have varying kinds of, um, of basically it just comes down to experience and, and, and the history in that area. Now, Every BHA in the world that is designed, even if it's a motor BHA or it is an RSS BHA, tends to follow either two, one, two, or three in one way, one form or the other. So these are the fundamentals of BHA design, but you then have to play, put this into perspective for what you want to do. Okay. And then there's bit selection. Basically, it comes down to lithology and economics. Now, forget about anything else. That's what it comes down to. There's no need to run a $78,000 bit to drill at 500 feet an hour at two, for, two, for 300 feet. Okay? Doesn't make any sense. So you might as well just pick up a roller cone bit and do it at half, the, half that at half the cost. And you would get it done in about three or four hours anyway. Okay? So it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. But having said that, I don't know how many of you are drilling engineers or have gone done the so-called bit optimization um, 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 solution, classic solution, which either gives you, which either tells you that you need about 67% um, hydraulic horsepower or about 40% or 80% depending on how they work it out of jet impact force. Let me be honest with you, those are nice for drill bits people, but in actual fact, sorry, it doesn't mean anything. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to what you can carry out of the hole. It doesn't matter how much hydraulic horsepower you have at the bit, if you cannot lift the curtains, it ain't going nowhere. It doesn't matter how much jet impact force you have at the, at the bit, if you're drilling in granite, you're not gonna make much progress. However, if you are drilling in a place where you know you can get extremely high ROPs, you have to optimize the system so that your entire system from your mud pumps, all right, or basically a standpipe down the drill string and back again to surface can be managed by your pumps. And you can clean the hole and you can maintain and achieve the ROP that you intend to. So it comes down to more classic solutions, such as carrying capacity of the mud, which is basically your slip velocities, and how you can actually get those curtains to surface. And also critical to the success is not the instantaneous ROP of the bit, but the durability of the drill bit, as well as its stability for tool phase control. Every directional driller will tell you, take out stability, in tool phase control, 
and whatever you're doing, you're yo-yoing. Because where you will end up drilling at 70 or 80 or 90 or maybe 150 feet an hour overall ROP, you might get instantaneous ROPs of 300 when you are rotating without caring about direction and you will get as little as two feet an hour when you're trying to steer because you're fighting with stability or two-phase control. So your selection of the bit has to come down to what gives you the overall effective rate of penetration, not instantaneous. So it, it doesn't matter if you have 19 millimeter cutters or 12 meter cutters, it makes no, or, or nine or 11, makes no difference. As long as you are able to deliver a bit that can give your drilling crew some sort of tool phase stability. So everything that we've talked about, technique to plan the well and technique to design the BHA comes down to one thing, the very first thing that hits the formation, the bit. And then the rest you can play around with to control things like vibration, to control stick slip, and to control well bore cleaning and the potential for stockpile. And of course, you have talk and drag. I won't dwell on this. It, the same thing comes down to BHA design, B selection, uh, which will now govern your soil parameters and the ability of your rig and drilling crew to deliver that. All right. So basically, if you are drilling directionally, what you want to do is minimize frictional losses, either in drag, during drag, or in rotation. You want to be able to, because you see, if you minimize drag, it means you can easily run in and out of hole without restriction or with little restriction. If you minimize frictional losses, it means that you are getting much, much or most of your RPM and your weight on bit from surface to your bit to initiate drill off, which means that you can drill better and faster. So that's it in a nutshell. I hope I did it within time frame. Okay, any questions? Yes, you did, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I got carried away with the lectures. I didn't think it has already come to an end yet. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we can go ahead and use the reaction button to drop um, a hand clap or something for our speaker. That was a wonderful and an excellent delivery and lecture. Thank you, Rukweb. And you can also use the chat box also to drop comments and commendation for a job well done. Thank you so much, sir. So that was um, Sir Chimere Nkwacha, who just took us through the theme or topic, dr directional drilling. All right, so um, I have some questions. It looks like most of your questions were sent to me directly instead of in the general chat box. So um, I'm just going to be reading them to you. I okay. hope I would be able to send the message the way the people want it. <laughs> no problem. Okay. All right, so the first question um, from Peter, I think he said he wants to know um, how is directional or horizontal hold able to withstand against Overburden pressure. It's easy. It's easy. It comes down to hoop stresses, all right? So, and your hydraulics. I mean, you're, you're, you are able to contain, basically you remove part of the overburden, yes, but you replace that with heavy fluid and most of the time is dynamic, okay? And um, as long as you have a structurally, um, a structurally um, integral um, um, formation, it will hold. We are dealing with a case right now in India where it is obvious that the formation is not, the integrity of the of that little of that formation is 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 uh, is in question. Every time they go through it, it breaks down. And um, we tried to run the rimmer shoot through it. There was no hole to go beyond um, 8,500 feet. Uh, they went back in hole, had to do a sidetrack. And since then, they've had total collapse. And some of these formations are also, it's not about the, it's not normally about 
just the hoop stress alone is just the fact that some of them react um, do, do react over time. They are chemically active and, and, and will then become mechanically, um, um, will now collapse mechanically. Um, so it, it, a lot of things that we do in the industry is time dependent. So the, the reason why you are able to drill a hotel well for the length of the, the length that we drill them at nowadays, 30, 40 odd feet, thousand feet is because you are able to contain some of that you know, horizontal stress or vertical stress by just the, by the, the pressure that you exert from the fluid and also that you try not to distort the chemical composition of the, of the formation of the matrix. All right, thank you very much, sir. So um, basically, like you said, we use heavy fluids and also the lithology of the formation. So um, at, I think that's Pedro or Peter, I hope that um, helps. Um, also, you have another question here. Um, this is from Rukweb. Rukweb says, what is the difference between directional drilling and bio-steering? Bio-steering? Yes. I have never heard bio-steering. Okay. Um, Rukwe, if you're still on the call, you yes. can You can shed more light on bio -steering. Yes. You can unmute and try to shed more light. So our speaker will be able to answer that clearly. All right. So while uh, Rukwe is trying to unmute, if he or she would, um, I go to the next question. This is from Igolo. It says, what is the safe anti collision distance? Oh, it's frankly speaking. Okay, so what we do is this. We run an anti-collision program on the cluster and any nearby wells identified. Normally we try to stay at 1.5 collision safety factor. What that means is if you divide the distance between the, 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 the ellipses, all right, that I collide, well, the way it's colliding, uh, if you find distance, more better by 1.5, so you stay, at, that's a ratio, you stay above that, right? Which means that it gives a 3% um, additional safety margin. Now, these are all mathematical derivations. The truth is they are not exact. That's why we throw in safety factors into them. So, Watch, so, so basically 1.5 is an industry standard. In some instances, clients have used 1.15 or 1.25. So it all depends on, on the customer. In some of these instances, they've used one, all right? Which means they are pretty much almost touching. But it, it, it comes down to, let me put it this way. In some areas, you do not have any other choice but to drill them, and you already have that safety constraint. So you go and get an exemption from the customer, and then you gently find your way around that cluster until you know you are safe. So the, the truth is the, the industry uses 1.5 as a general rule for safety factor, but it's still a mathematical derivation that assumes that the survey, um, the survey, the quality of the survey, the survey that you attribute to each of the wells is correct. Does that make sense? Well, it does for me. Um, Igolo, does it make sense to you? Um... Okay, let me just move on to the next question. Um, this is from Collins. Collins said, if you are drilling ERD wells, mm -hmm. how do you ensure that you don't have pull-out hole to check if you to check if your butt is one? The bit is one? Uh, he said butt, like B. I think it means bit. Who, I think it means bit, yeah. How do you pull out to check if your bit is worn and reduced, or if it has reduced the NPT, if you're drilling um, EROD wells? 
Okay, somebody. Um, so who is who is the person who said that? This is from Collins. Okay, okay, Collins. Okay, Collins. Um, listen. If you are doing an ERD well, you will have at least three other stabilizers in that hole, and normally they will be near gauge, one eighth or a quarter on the gauge. Um, worst case scenario. And if your bit is worn sooner or later, your drag coefficient will increase and definitely your ROP will drop. You pull out a hole almost the same way as you pull out a hole on, from any other well. The only difference is if you have tight spots in an ERD well uh, the, the, uh, and you have to back rim, for example, the rule of thumb is that you should back rim all the way to the previous casing shoe. And there, are, and normally there is a there is a, a certain degree of um, rotation that's required to get that done. So, and the whole idea is that you clean the well bore completely of any cuttings as you come up into the previous casing casing, and you can clean you can circulate that out, or you can find a way to get that out of surface without endangering yourself or or packing yourself off into a into a tight spot. It's a lot easier to deal in case deal with in casing. So you pull out. That's what you. That's those are the simple rules that you follow. However, what I always say is it doesn't matter what kind of well you drill. The well always speaks, and the well. If there's any old drilling hand in this in this in this in this meeting, that we say the same. The well always tells you what's happening. Sometimes we do not pay attention. Sometimes we do. And normally when we don't pay attention and overlook it and there is imp impending danger or, or, or uh, incident, you will always pay the price. When you pay attention to the well, you seem to always be proactive in dealing with the concerns as they come about. And, the, and if you look at it, every well that we drill anywhere in the world has, has a sequence of events that are symptomatic to a certain um, cure or event. And as long as you can derive that and you can see that happening, you can deal with the event before your calls. Does that make sense? All right. So this is from someone else. It says, um, okay, we have a few more minutes because this meeting has to start by seven. <laughs> so we might not take all your questions, but we're going to try to see as much as we can take. Um, the next question says, um, what is basically the difference between directional wells and non-vertical wells? You mean deviated wells? Any well that is not vertical is a deviated well and is a directional well, period. There's no difference. All right. Un unless then, it's accidental. Okay. And then um, it says, again, in high consolidated formations, like the quass formation in the Middle East, how is the whip stock installed there the same way it's if it's if it's hard it's good it can it can it will it will hold itself i mean most whip stocks are installed in casing um some of them are installed in open hole um so it doesn't make a difference it, 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 because when you do it in open hole you always have to put a support beneath the case it, it, the whip stock either it's going to be an open hole bridge plug or a cement plug and then you put the case, you put it in there like the one I showed you, where you actually run it in hole, you cement it in place, and then you come out with your with your drill string or BHA and sidetrack off the all the all of the face of the whip stock. That's an open hole, so it makes no difference if it's granite. If it's well, you don't really have granite or quartz in the Middle East. You have a lot of limestone uh, uh, in the top, and then you have sandstones and sandstones in, uh, in much deeper horizons. Um, but it's still the same, the same thing. The, the procedure wouldn't change because rock is rock as long as you can anchor it. You can, if you can anchor it in soft formation, you can anchor it in, in, in information with pretty good integrity. Okay, thank you. All uh, right, just you hang on, hang on. Can you go back to the question on the bio, bio steering? I think what the person meant was just steering. Is a clarification from, from someone on the... So what was the question again? The difference between um, directional drilling 
and dual steering? They are not, they, they are, they can be one and the same, but they are different kinds of expertise. Dual steering means that, let me put it this way, you have you have a bed, a bed that has a dip on it in Nida Delta. Let's just say you have somewhere in Soku. Soku, you're drilling a well, it's not a well. And you, you've got a dip, a dip of say two degrees. Okay. And it's dipping away from you, dipping is going down from you, and you are, you are you've got to follow it. If you don't follow, you're going to exit probably 300 feet in the whole in the in the drain section. But not just following the top of the sand. You have an active water contact, and you have an, you know, I mean, and you also have an active gas cap, but you need to stay, say, one or two feet away from the gas cap, all right, and definitely away from the oil water contact. All right. So what you do is you now follow, all right, the basically the dip, and you follow the resistivity data, all right, as it, that it gives you. Um, when you point up or down, it tells you you can get deep resistivities and you can get um, you can get um, shallow ones. And based on where that those those intersect, you can tell exactly where the fluid boundaries will. You can suspect, and you just stay and guide yourself through that. The directional driller is, in, is giving the targets, the changing targets to aim for by the well placement of Justin experts. So they go hand in hand. Okay, thank you very much. So um, Obianuji, I see your hand up. Um, let's just take your question quickly. And I'm going to read one more question from Nengi and we'll have to put it to an end there. Um, the rest of us, you can always um, connect with um, Mr. Chimere on LinkedIn or any of his social media handles. And he, I'm sure he will be delighted and glad to answer all your question and curiosity. So Abiyanu, you please go ahead on mute yourself and you can speak. Is Abiyanu still on the call? Obianuja, I saw your hand up. Good evening. I'm good sorry. Evening. Um, I was trying to unmute. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Chimere. That evening. was a very fantastic presentation there. Um, I'm personally aesthetic about it due to my recent interest in logging while drilling and directional drilling. So it's, uh, the presentation came at a very uh, perfect time for me. And straight to my question, um, I know that um, formation evaluation is uh, carried out. It's important to carry out uh, formation evaluation so as to determine the design, the design of uh, bits that will be used. And when it comes to the bottom hole assembly, um, designs, especially for the sleek BHA designs, where there's no stabilization component in the drill string. Um, I'm curious as to what kind of formation would this kind of assembly work with? Come up with that. So um, I said, um, when it comes to um, the sleek BHA, BHA yeah. Yeah. yeah, where there's no stabilization components yes. in the drill string. So I'm curious to what kind of formation uh, this kind of assembly, what kind of formation would this assembly work with, knowing that, um, of course, the formation evaluation would have been done. But I'm just curious to know what kind of formation uh, the sleek BHV perfect for. You want, let me, I'll give you my mind honest opinion on slick BHAs. Slick BHAs should be run only where you have extremely soft formations and you can pump as high as possible. Yes. When doing a pilot hole in deep water, for example, where you don't really care where it ends up as long as it gets to TD because you have, you have shallow gas, that's perfect. You just, you just want to drill the nine, five, seven, eight inch hole or eight and a half inch hole and pump a thousand gallons through it, knowing it's soft and it will cut through the gas, get to bottom 
and you can you can then come out of hole knowing fully whether you've you found a way to to get the shallow gas dissipating and then run case go back in hole open that up and um, and fill it up that's the only condition where you really don't care whether it, which direction it goes it's normally going to be very short and um, and so the, the direction you wherever you end up is redeemable and recoverable that's number one secondly you want to you want to you will probably run a slick BHA people run it as clean up BHA is only inside casing it is not advisable to run a slick BHA in a directional well. What we found out from in directional drilling is it's best to run the same BHA you use to drill the well as a cleanup BHA because it will follow the natural tendency that you drilled of that well bore, which is based on that BHA, or design a BHA that somewhat resembles it that you can use to clean out. All right. So those are the things. So. Frankly, slick BHA, no stabilizer, is basically to just run a bit of a scraper. It's like a scraper run uh, inside casing to clean out cement um, because you really can't even slack of weight on it. It will, just, it will just bend in every direction, so you can end up anywhere. So it's going to be for short distances. It doesn't matter if it's hard or soft or extremely soft formations where you're basically jetting against, jetting away the formation as you, as you go down. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Okay, because of time, let's just take um, one minute, turn on your videos, your camera, and let's take a quick snapshot um, before we continue the meeting further. So please, I'd like us to turn on our cameras, our videos, so I can take a quick picture here. So I can close the, I think I can close, I can stop sharing now, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Am I, am I showing myself? I think you are. I my background is showing. actually dark a bit. <laughs> my, my background, your background? No, yours. Yours, no, yours is fine. Mine is dark is what I'm saying. Okay. All right. All right. So yeah, I'm taking. While you're turning it, you want to take it now or do I, can I go ahead and answer the question? I'm taking pictures already, so yeah. Okay, fine. All right, so we're good. Obian, would you please go ahead and take the membership drive? Thank you. Ah, okay, so I've seen some questions here. So let me just deal with them there straight up. Um, it was able to cut through more of please. Is it just one well fixed? Yes, you can. When you have a okay, so in 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 Malabo or in Equatorial Guinea, on the jade platform or the jade field that ExxonMobil runs, or I don't know, I think they're still there. They, they they have lenses as reservoirs. So the only way to make it economical is to drill extended reach wells to cut across as many lenses as possible. Otherwise, the jade platform cannot pay for itself. So yes, it can be done. Um, which is preferable between a mod motor and RSS. It depends on the objective and the, and the challenge. If you're gonna, basically, if you're gonna just drill, build and hold 30, 40 degrees and that's it, at three degrees per hundred, I can almost bet you that a mod motor will outperform an RSS, pretty much in most cases. The only time that it will not is when you need to you need to do a lot of steering, um, uh, uh, and uh, 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 which means that you now spend a lot of time orienting your 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 your, your orienting the tool phase, trying to get the steering done. So anywhere where you do 20, 30 percent steering and the rest on rotary um, on a mod motor, I can almost guarantee that a mod motor will be more efficient. However. When you are drilling very long sections, it doesn't matter how well a mod motor does, it's a lot easier to recover with, a, with an RSS than a mod motor because a, an RSS has everything from just above the bit to the top of the LW tool all in sync and communicating with themselves. So you have a bit more information. Also, most of your of your um, of your logging wire drilling technology like you to rotate the string 
All right, so the RSS comes in. So it comes down to the objective. So you have to weigh the pros and cons. And of course, it comes down to what we call, what we call the you know, cost of the well per barrel of oil expected, which is a, a metric that the EMP companies use. So if at the end of the day, you can tick all the boxes for, for formation evaluation, production optimization uh, and design, as well as drilling with, with one or the other, and then you go with the one that makes the most sense and gives you the efficiency without compromising or introducing any more risks than the other one. The answer to question on fishing tools is no. You try that, you will not come out of hole. That's why we do not drill with a meal. Otherwise you will, you will end up boiling it up and you will not make much progress. You will get stuck and you will sidetrack the well. Ooh, good question um, on wearable stability. We handle it like we handle, um, what would I say? We handle it by either, we're playing around with the, um, with, the, with the mod weight or the direction of strike. Sometimes in a highly technically active or a place that, is, that, is, um, that's, that has a lot of fractures, you tend to stay away from the direction of in-situ maximum stress. You want to hit it at perpendicular instead, at least along the build section, and, and, and you should be fine. Normally your problem, the problem you, in, you face is normally along the build section because then you're, you're dealing with both vertical and horizontal stresses. Whereas once you are horizontal, you're dealing with only one stress direction. Okay. Any other question? I think I've asked all the questions here from Okay. All right. Thank you so much, sir. So please, yes. Obianuji, you can go ahead, unmute, and give give us a membership drive. Really quick one, please. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Once again, um, since this is going to be very quick, um, I don't think I'll be using a slide. So um, I'll just uh, say briefly uh, what SP is all about. Um, as a lot of us already know, SP is um, Society of Petroleum Engineers, and it's an exploration and production community uh, that helps um, professionals, students, and uh, those who have interest in the oil and gas industry come together and share their knowledge, experience, and skills. It's not far fetched from what is being done here today uh, with Mr. Chimiri uh, sharing his knowledge and his experience in the industry. So this is basically what SP is all about. So it's one of the largest organizations that you can find in the upstream segments of the oil and gas industry. Oil and gas industry. So as far as the oil and gas industry is concerned, uh, we all know that every uh, the industry is actually actually multidisciplinary. So every form of every kind of professional is found in the oil and gas industry. As long as you have um, a skill to offer, something to offer the industry, then uh, you can find the seismologist, you can find the geochemist, the physicist, the chemist, the biologist. You can find uh, people in management, software developers, HR legals and support. So we don't just have the petroleum engineers in the oil and gas industry. We will have the mathematician. So because of this, SP is a very, has a wild range of uh, wild range of uh, professionals amongst us. And um, for our young programs uh, events like this one, um, we actually hold this as um, to help um, young professionals um, go down their career paths or go up their career paths in a very steady manner. So um, one of the things that um, we offer is um, technical sections like this, mentorship sections, webinars, training courses. So um, it's important that for you to get access to this um, features um, that SP has to offer, then you, you should be registered as an SP member so if you need to get registered, 
um, with and get your membership ID, which should be recognized internationally. It's important that you get registered at sp.org. Um, you click membership, you pick a young professional, and then you pay um, a little deal of about $20. Um, and then you're going to be duly registered. Um, if you're a student, of course, you know that's free. And if you recently transitioned from being a student to a young professional, um, if you were once a student member, then you have one year free um, of membership. So um, I guess that is all I'll be saying about SP today because of our time. Uh, thank you for listening. Back to you, Douglas. All right, so thank you so much, Abdanuju, um, for that wonderful and brief membership drive. So we look forward to those of us who are not SP member joining SPE and those of us who are to continue to retain our membership. All right, so at this time, we'll move on to the next uh, agenda for today, which is announcement. We have lots and lots of wonderful, um, beautiful programs coming up. We have... Um, the Young Professionals Tomorrow will be having a car wash stroke um, cleaning of houses. Um, it's cleaning January to raise fund for charity projects. Um, we have three projects in mind we want to execute, which sums up to about 4 million or 4 million plus. So we'll be doing a car wash um, event tomorrow where people come to wash their cars and every money made will go will go to the um, charity project. And then on Tuesday, next week Tuesday, which is about in three or four days from now, we'll be having our annual technical symposium and exhibition. Um, you can see the panel section and the moderator is power packed, is um, people from the oil and gas industry, both in academia and also in the industry directly with wealth, of knowledge and wealth of experience. It's a physical event, actually a hybrid event. So um, you can join virtually or you can come physically to the uh, venue and join us. That's at Spring Place um, at Audley Road, um, Port Harcourt. The event starts by 10 a.m. We're going to be having exhibition stands and um, display of the best class technologies and all that. So look forward to having all of us here on the call, spread the message, tell others and plan to join. Also, we have um, for the same next week, we have our monthly technical meeting. Now that's a section monthly technical meeting. It's a bigger version of what we're doing right now. And they also have the question for the day that we can participate in since on the system. And then also the children's day. Why is I'm not sure. And then also we have a Children's Day Fun Fiesta on the 22nd um, of May. That is next week, Friday. This is a council event for children to celebrate the Children's Day with them. So um, please pass the message on. So at this time, we'll just quickly take our closing remark so we can close this meeting um, finally. Call on us, uh, Programs Chairman, I think he's still on the call. Uh, Mr. Daniel Abia, to please go ahead and give us the honors of saying the closing remark. Okay, I don't see Mr. Daniel anymore on the call. Well, I see Mr. Otman Mohammed, our section director. So please, sir, if you can unmute, could you please go ahead and give us the closing remarks, sir? Alaji, sir, are you on the call? Hello, Alaji, sir. Okay, if Alaji is not um, on the call, or maybe I'd like to call on, I see Kristen. Um, Kristen is one of our active YP and a very in fact, a, a driller, I, I'm sure. So 
let me give her the opportunity to please go ahead and give us the closing remark. That way she can also spread the testimony of the amazing things this um, program did <laughs> for her. Go ahead, Kristen, please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chimery. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. So actually, when I first saw the flyer, I was wondering, you know, how can one, how is someone going to um, cover the basis of the original drilling, well planning, optimization, and all of that in one single meeting? I thought it was impossible, but listening to you, you gave a very excellent delivery. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you so much for, you know, even for people that have no experience at all at least they were able to grab um, a thing or two. So personally, I am a drilling engineer, not a directional driller, but I also learned a couple of new things um, from your presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, we are all very grateful, uh, SPCS 103, probably the YPs for giving us your time from your very busy schedule. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Christine. And uh, thank you again, once again, Mr. Chimere, for the wonderful lecture. It was um, quite impactful and very, very apt at the appropriate and perfect timing. Thank you so much. We sincerely do appreciate. And, you know, like they say, if somebody does something very well, and does it perfectly. They will definitely keep calling them again. So please keep your lines open for us <laughs> as we'll be reaching out to you and calling you also for future events to please come and share your wealth of knowledge again with us. So thank you, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining this call, everyone on the call, especially those of us that stay till the end. Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and take a closing prayer and then we can wrap it up. Please, I'll call a volunteer, anyone to volunteer and go ahead and give us a closing prayer. Do we have any volunteer to give us a closing prayer? Or are we having issues on muting? Okay, let me give everybody access to on mute. Okay, nobody wants to pray. Maybe I should literally call your name. Um, John, your name is showing up first on my screen. So please go ahead and give us an opening prayer. Closing prayer. Oh, closing prayer. You see, I don't even want us to go. <laughs> okay, um, let's um, be in the mood of prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you once again for this lecture uh, we received. Thank you for the knowledge. Thank you for the enlightenment. Thank you for everything we have learned. We pray that um, you will enrich our speaker, give him more knowledge, replenish everything he has given to us, and even add more. And above all, you protect us, guide us, and um, for those who are still on their way back home, you take them back safely. For in Jesus' precious and mighty name of prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, everybody. And good night and have a wonderful night rest, everyone. And for those of us still on transit, keep safe going. Thank you, Mr. Chimer. Yeah, and you take care, Thank okay. you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.